Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Masha Prodanovic from the University of Texas at Austin, and I am uh, very pleased to welcome Dr. Gary Srinivasan today, who will give our uh, GeoSciam activity group on geosciences webinar and open our <laughs> fall season and the entire year with a bang. She will speak on modeling flow and transport in fractured rock using machine learning. And before I give her the chance to um, uh, present on this topic, I will just like to go over a couple of things that are related to our activity group. Uh, so let me see. So first, uh, if you would like to engage, uh, you can go to Siam Engage <laughs> website, and this is where most of the announcements are happening. Uh, there are There is the um, activity group uh, membership web website, as well as the main uh, Siam website. So all of them are going from siam.org. Um, this Siam Wiki page is pretty basic, but it's actually updated and it has all of the relevant information. Now, I always say this, so I will uh, say it again. If you are a student, there are free student memberships. There are ways to join Siam for free and enjoy uh, all of the uh, chances to both present and participate in conferences, as well as uh, learn about uh, how to interview and all kinds of uh, activities that are actually geared at students and uh, getting them, moving them forward in their careers. So please explore that. And if you have any questions, you can uh, contact any of the officers. And my slide got scrambled. I apologize for that. But we are easy to find online. Chair Zinga Bere, Vice Chair Vladimir Drushkin, myself, uh, Program Director, as well as Secretary Chris Keyes. One big thing that is happening this year, and we are gearing up for it, is the uh, our conference on mathematical and computational issues in the geosciences. It's going to happen in June in Bergen, Norway. And most important deadline right now to remember is November 21st. I hope you all submit uh, mini symposia proposals. After those are processed, we're going to have um, contributed lecture poster and presentation abstracts due in December. So mark your calendars June 19th to 22nd uh, for the conference itself. November 21st for mini symposia proposals, should you want to organize one, or December 19th, just before the holiday season kicks in full gear, <laughs> uh, you will get a chance to submit an abstract and then enjoy the holidays. Okay. So um, I would like to now uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Gary Srinivasan, and I changed my uh, so I changed my uh, computer, so uh, font slide, uh, fonts in this, slide are playing a game with me. <laughs> so I apologize for strange folks choice. Um, so this talk uh, will uh, be uh, recorded. So just in case you missed it or you want to point somebody else, it's going to show up within a day or two on the Siam YouTube. And we have our playlist as a um, uh, geosciences group on there. And I would like to point out that we have this basically once a month. So in November and December, we're going to welcome professors Nordboden and Pizhenska. Now, Dr. Srinivasan uh, will uh, speak on machine learning for transport in uh, regular and fractured rock. The most, fract uh, most rock out there is fractured. <laughs> she has PhD in applied mathematics and as such has applied her uh, talents to multiple different pro problems. Right now, she's deputy division leader of physics division at Los Alamos National Lab and has held multiple leadership positions um, in uh, Los Alamos prior to that. But she has 18 years of experience in modeling various complex systems. And we know that rocks and fractured rocks are very complex. Um, she likes uh, uh, applying both network to theory and most recently, everybody's working in machine learning. So <laughs> those uh, tools as well to the transport in rock system, but his uh, rock systems, but also uh, prior she's been looking at any type of materials in extreme conditions. Uh, so extreme temperatures, extreme pressures in both subsurface and weapon systems. 
uh, contaminant per, uh, transport in uh, subsurface and groundwater, uh, propagation of light in disordered fiber arrays, um, and uh, as well as studying the Atlantic uh, Ocean cir circulation. So this is a wide range of application uh, befitting a PhD in applied mathematics. With, without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and I will like, let Dr. Srinivasan take it away. Thank you so much, Masha. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody. Um, you can hear me just fine. Yes. Okay. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Let's, um... Did that work? Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. It gives me great pleasure to be um, in front of you all, to, you know, talking about my research. And as um, you know, Masha mentioned, the many different applications. That's one of the nice things about being an applied mathematician. You can uh, apply the tools of your trade to many different applications. And um, I've been very fortunate in my career because I'm a very easily distracted person. I find many things interesting. And um, so I've been lucky enough uh, to be able to find uh, many different applications uh, that are you know, of interest. And um, you know, being at the lab, uh, it's not just sufficient that an application be um, interesting. Uh, you know, we also have an additional consideration of you know, how does this further, um, you know, because we are funded by the Department of Energy, how does this uh, you know, further you know, the uh, national missions that the national labs are, you know, tasked with. Um, and, you know, none of this work would have been possible if not for my amazing team members. And uh, another nice thing about working at the national lab is that you get to interact with a um, huge, you know, set of people, like lots of uh, problems are multidisciplinary in nature. Um, and it's very hard to only work with other applied mathematicians. So in this uh, list that you see here, I have listed statisticians, uh, geologists, geophysicists, um, you know, up, other applied mathematicians, uh, environmental engineers, chemical engineers. Um, so uh, that's another nice thing about um, trying to solve a really complex problem. You need expertise that's well outside your area. Uh, and so it's very nice to be able to bring a whole bunch of people together, uh, you know, material scientists as well. Um, and so um, that that's going to be like a common theme in this um, set of uh, slides that I'm going to show you. This is all a multidisciplinary effort. And um, we wanna thank uh, the, LDRD, which is the Lab Directed Research and Development Program for giving us the opportunity. Uh, it's a competitive process. So uh, we had to submit a proposal and we got picked. Um, and uh, you know, we get to work on this problem for about three years. Those three years have now elapsed. But uh, since then, we've been able to spin off um, the tools that we developed and the understanding that we gained into multiple other uh, projects ranging from, you know, um, collaborations with uh, universities to um, industry to, you know, additional uh, just um, applied programs. Okay. Um, so uh, very quickly, you know, the, uh, I'm not going to read through the entire abstract, but as Masha mentioned, uh, you know, the focus is going to be subsurface flow and transport. A lot of it happens through fractured systems. Um, and so, what I'm going to uh, talk about is, um, you know, moving away from what the community has done uh, for a long time, which is try to, um, you know, look at continuum models, but trying to make um, a paradigm shift, uh, trying to look at what are the, um, you know, parameters that really come into play when you talk about flow and transport and uh, fractured systems. And uh, you know, looking at the structure of these fractures and uh, trying to figure out if we can um, capture that information um, in a reasonable manner uh, that allows us to come up with uh, decision making. So, uh, being at the lab, I talked about not only does the problem have to be interesting, but it has to be very relevant as well. And a couple of applications that really motivated us um, here at Lanel. Uh, we're looking at um, a national security 
like a global security kind of application, and that's nuclear non-proliferation. Um, we want to make sure that you know we did uh, the. Um, the U.S. signed a comprehensive test ban treaty, and a bunch of other nations are part of that too, where we agreed to not perform um, any uh, testing underground or above ground. Um, you know that results in a certain amount of um, uh, yield. So um, when something goes boom, um, you know there could be multiple different reasons for that to happen. It could just be an earthquake. Or it could be um, a test, a test that, uh, you know, some nations um, that might be, you know, uh, undertaking. Um, so we want to understand when we hear a boom, is this a man-made explosion or is this uh, just a natural um, earthquake? And if it's a man-made explosion, what are the consequences for security for the people that live around that area? or for, you know, just, um, uh, you know, as you all know very well, uh, the posture in the world is kind of one of escalating tension. And in these times, it's really important to make sure we understand uh, what various, um, you know, foreign governments, what various entities, uh, not even just government, could be non-governmental entities, uh, might be up to. So nuclear non-proliferation is a very important uh, topic uh, for Los Alamos and the Department of Energy. Um, so in this particular case, we are most uh, concerned with figuring out when we hear a boom, um, can we in fact ascertain whether uh, there are certain chemical signatures that would point to uh, a certain type of test? Um, not going to say more about that, except that in this particular case, we are still looking at flow and transport of gases. Um, on, in the subsurface, because a lot of these tests are underground, and we are trying to figure out when the gases escape to the atmosphere, can we use sensors and detect uh, what kind of gases escape? Uh, for example, if we detect xenon gas, then we have uh, you know some indication that this was indeed a you know, nuclear type explosion. Um, in this case, we're not interested in the entire breakthrough curve. We're mostly interested in figuring out when the first concentrations of gas come out and in order to be able to get the signature right. Um, I'm gonna talk about another application that's also of interest, um, and this is uh, hydraulic fracturing um, in shale. Um, Again, uh, you know, conditions around the world are uh, fairly unstable at the current moment, and we are always looking for um, alternative energy sources. And one such energy source that has shown promise is um, natural gas. And the way uh, we uh, extract natural gas, it sits in deposits underground, and a lot of it is in fractured rock. It sits in shale, which is naturally uh, fractured. And uh, in this case, we're trying to extract the um, hydrocarbons. And uh, here we are interested in the entire breakthrough curve. It's not only about what comes out initially, but we are trying to extract the entire deposit out. Um, so it just goes to show that here's a couple of applications and you may be, you know, as um, a you know, hydrologist or a hydrogeologist, you may be trying to model these applications with the same type of tools. However, the quantities of interest, depending upon the application could be very, very different. And this is just um, um, you know, a couple different examples that um, show uh, the applications. And I, I will talk about at the very end, um, another application that we are starting to get more and more interested in, uh, which is uh, geologic uh, sequestration of uh, CO2. Uh, we do have uh, people working on multiple aspects of climate change. Uh, Masha mentioned initially that um, uh, several years ago, I was very interested in looking at ocean circulation. So I was looking at the AMOC, uh, how that's, uh, affected by you know, salinity and temperature and things like that. Um, and this is just such a cascading loop, uh, right? Because you have, um, as our icebergs melt, we have lower salinity, but also higher temperatures. Um, so there's many aspects of climate research that happens at Los Alamos. And one of the things that we are um, it, being funded to uh, pursue in the future is to look at, can we take uh, CO2 gas and can we uh, sequester it 
Um, and one of the ways we can sequester it is through mineral uh, mineralization or reactions in the subsurface. Uh, so that's yet another application that um, continues to motivate us. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly uh, jump into the problem, and uh, you know, please interrupt at any time. I'm open to questions. Um, uh, of course, um, I will leave it up to uh, the moderator to um, let me know if there is a question that's so pressing that it makes sense to talk about it before we go forward. Um, you know, as modelers, um, the biggest challenge has been how do we uh, represent fractured networks. Uh, it's not easy. Underlying to fracture networks is a fundamental structure. And so fractured networks uh, fall under a class of structured systems. And these kind of structured systems are ubiquitous. Um, and the thing that uh, sort of guides um, the physics that ends up happening is uh, the geometry and the connectivity. And um, if you think about modeling that we've um, undertaken in the last 50-ish you know, uh, years or so, uh, we've done a lot of continuum modeling. We also do modeling at the lower uh, length scales, but we um, have run into this upscaling issue enough that people understand that there is a huge benefit to representing a reservoir scale model. However, uh, anybody that's done modeling at the reservoir scale understands that you have to, when you do a continuum model, because you can't possibly do any, um, you know, atomistic or, you know, um, meso scale type of modeling, um, just because of the computational difficulties. Um, so when we try to represent um, properties, um, you know, hydrological properties or geological or chemical properties at the continuum level, um, we tend to run into intractable, uh, you know, computational models very quickly. Um, so I'm going to give you an example here. I'm looking at one of the cells um, of this giant continuum model, and one of the cells could have, uh, you know, hundreds of fractures. And um, typically, we, you know, at Los Alamos, we do have a fracture modeling um, a software called DFN Works. That's Discrete Fracture Networks. Um, and you could very quickly run into just one cell having uh, you know, a million to billions of degrees of freedom. And so clearly all of this is not going to be um, you know, computationally feasible, right? So what we do is we say, okay, let's average out properties. Let's represent an average permeability, average porosity, um, um, maybe some average conducting properties and uh, let's represent that in our continuum. However, um, what we're losing when we do that kind of a transformation is very critical um, microstructure information on the geometry. And I mentioned the connectivity, uh, the topology plays a very big role. And we end up losing all that information when we upscale this to the continuum model. So we came up with, okay, well, it's obviously not a good idea to lose the um, structural information. So how can we keep the structural information uh, yet try to sim simplify the problem in a bunch of different ways that we are not adding to the uh, computational burden, but we maintain uh, the information that seems to be relevant to flow, flow and transport in fractured rocks. So uh, we came up with, okay, well, let's not represent each mesh element on a fracture. Let's instead represent um, the fracture as a graph. Uh, this is a network, so you know uh, graphical representations are very suitable for networks. Um, and so instead of uh, modeling like thousands of uh, finite element um, cells on a single fracture, let's just abstract it all into uh, say one to start with. Can we talk about every fracture is probably just represented by one um, node here in my uh, graph in the middle that I have. And let's say if two fractures intersect, then we're gonna join those two by an edge. So we have a vertex that represents fracture one and another vertex that represents fracture two. And if the two intersect, meaning there's connectivity between the two, then let's represent that as an edge. And the nice thing about doing that is we can now uh, 
um, inherit properties on this graph uh, for the vertex and for the edges, we can um, inherit uh, geometric properties. Like we can talk about uh, what is the size of the fracture, what's the aperture, uh, you know, what's the diameter of a fracture, what's the length of a fracture, and what is the location of that fracture, um, the orientation. So some um, and the con in a, connectivity. So some kind of um, you know topological information. Um, and we can also inherit properties like permeability, et cetera, um, on these vertices and these edges. So that was our first attempt at saying, OK, the connection seems to matter. Because it's not just about, OK, I'm going to model a bunch of huge fractures, right? Because sometimes these smaller fractures play a very important role. Like you can have one huge fracture over here, another huge fracture over here. But if you miss out on the information that they are connected through a bunch of smaller fractures and you say, oh, I'm only going to worry about fractures above a certain size, then you're missing very key connectivity information. However, we cannot model all the smaller fractures like I mentioned. So abstracting all of these into a graph seemed to be a very reasonable um, hypothesis for us to say, okay, can we capture connectivity information and then see if we get good success with modeling at the continuum level? So that's kind of the underlying philosophy and I've like set the stage uh, for what was the thought process behind how we go into um, you know, um, solving these flow and transport problems in the subsurface. Okay, so we essentially came up with a couple different workflows. Um, one, you know, we always at the top um, left corner, you see there's the fracture rock at the field site. That's kind of what outcrops look like. And we know underneath uh, um, the subsurface, we have a lot of uh, such fractured formations. And so um, the DFN works uh, software that I talked about, if you were to do a very high fidelity model of um, looking at every single fracture and intersection and doing a finite element uh, breakup of um, this feature, uh, you would end up with a high fidelity model. And we talked about that could be billions in, uh, of um, you know, degrees of freedom that you end up solving. And also recall that since all of this is happening in the subsurface, you don't really know what these fractures look like. It's just a um, stochastic representation, right? Um, we can kind of guess as to where some of the larger features are. Uh, we can do some kind of core sampling to figure out what is the general uh, you know, orientation, permeability, et cetera, in multiple, um, you know, for a given site in multiple different areas. But, um, you know, when I draw a network like I have on the lower left corner, um, that is just my conceptual uh, feeling of what this might look like. And remember that we don't let, just look for one answer. I just don't want one first passage time or one breakthrough curve. We're going to put all of this in a UQ framework. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty in the subsurface for any of you that have worked with any complex system know that's the case and certainly that's the case in the subsurface. So it's not important for me to just figure out how to mesh the heck out of this one particular DFN, but I want to be able to mesh like thousands of such instances of stochastically generated DFNs to see what is the aggregate behavior, what are the kinds of variances that I'm seeing, and that's where it additionally becomes intractable. So we have this, uh, you know, going from what reality is, we have a high fidelity DFN representation of one such instance of what we think it might be. And I already talked to you about a great way to reduce the complexity of this problem, yet uh, retain the topology um, information is with this graph representation. And so now what? We've you know, moved from reality to the DFN model, which is really complex, to a much simplified graph representation. Now, what do we do? So now I'm gonna uh, talk you through two different workflows that we have. Um, one of the things, and again, this is uh, from a lot of different site characterization and expert uh, analysis, uh, we often find that we have a huge fractured system um, a lot of times, but only a fraction of that fractured system is actually participating in the flow and transport. So I may have um, you know, millions of fractures that I want to represent, but there's maybe 20% of that fracture network 
where there's actual flow and transport. So if I have gone and spent, uh, you know, whether it's FEM modeling or even the graph models, um, I'm representing a whole bunch of nodes and vertices. Now let's just talk about the graphs. Um, representing a whole lot of nodes and vertices uh, that are not needed and that are adding to the complexity of my computational uh, load. However, they're not really contributing much to the physics insights of what's happening. So idea number one was, okay, well, we have to prune the graph. Um, but you know, you don't want to just run a simulation and then, then say, oh, okay, these are the things that did not participate because by then, too late, right? You've already run your simulation. Uh, what's the point of then saying um, only 20% of my network participated? So what we would like to be able to do is have a crystal ball that tells you ahead of time, can I identify based on certain characteristics that I know already that only this portion of the network is going to be participating, okay? If I can do that, then I go from this bottom left model, which is the high fidelity DFN to this pruned DFN model. So that's a lot smaller. So can we go from, and also remember that complexity uh, scales as N squared. So if I've um, achieved a 10% reduction in my you know, DFN, uh, that's still quite a bit, okay? That's uh, an, you know 80% um, of the original fracture network. So um, pruning is certainly one of the ways we can go about it. Okay, another way we can go about things, and so that's the top branch. So we can have a prune DFN, and now what we do is we use graphical methods to prune the DFN, map it back to the DFN, and now I can run my FEM solver on that DFN and get quantities like breakthrough curves. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is, wait, We've gotten this nice graph representation. Can we not just conduct our modeling on the graph itself? Can we perhaps not run our flow and transport solutions on the graph and get quantities of interest like the breakthrough curve? Okay, so, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, no free lunch. So of course, when you've tried to reduce the complexity of a problem to you know 10 percent of the original, you're going to lose something um, in the bargain. And can we live with it? That's the question we're going to be asking. And it turns out, I'll preview the answer. As you can see here, we can live with it because it looks like typically what we give up when we go to the graph representation is. Um, we have a bunch of um, biases that we inherit because we don't have the entire representation. So um, in this picture, you see the DFN, which is the full fidelity uh, finite element model, the DFN and the graph. And if we understand what the biases look like, then can we correct the bias? And again, without a whole lot of computational burden, can we go ahead and predict what it might look like knowing what the graph solution is, can we extrapolate that to what the DFN solution might have been? Because remember, eventually, what we would love to be able to do is run this model that's on the bottom right uh, left, uh, the high fidelity DFN. If we could, we would want to run that millions of times. But we're trying to be clever and see, can we use machine learning? Can we use graph theory? Can we use all of those tools that we have available to us to reduce the complexity of the problem and yet not give up a whole lot? Okay, so I really wanted to spend a lot of time setting up the problem and I'm going to go over some of our results here and uh, you know just touch upon a few different results and what that led to. So one of the first things we uh, did, actually, one, actually the very first thing we did was look at, um, Anybody that's uh, you know even fairly briefly familiar with graph theory understands perhaps you've got a network, uh, you're starting at the inlet, you're going to the outlet. Um, you know what is the shortest path? That's something that um, most uh, people that are familiar even with an introduction to graph theory understand. So that's one of the first things we started with. We said, okay, forget everything else, forget any properties, forget. Um, anything about permeability or the you know, radius of the, um, you know, the pipe, um, the, the fracture or, you know, anything that's geometric or the orientations, let's first do a very quick 
just graph-based pruning? Can you look at the shortest path? Can you look at a collection of like 20 shortest paths? Uh, let's assume that uh, you know, fluids um, subsurface will take the path of least resistance. Uh, that's what most of us want to do, right? None of us want to walk all over the place and do a random walk and get there. We want to see what is the shortest path. How do we get from uh, point A to point B? So the first thing we did was the shortest path. And so that, that's a solution that I will show how that compares to. Then we said, okay, once we know that's the baseline for what we can do there, let's move on to a little bit more. Let's not throw out all of the information that we do know. So we went to a machine learning approach and we said, okay, we are going to look at a bunch of different features and we're gonna perform a classification problem on whether a fact fracture participates in the flow and transport and we're gonna call that the backbone. So is a fracture a part of the backbone or is it not? Okay, and what are the properties of a fracture that make it suitable for being part of a backbone? So um, obviously, you know, we had to train a whole bunch of um, uh, networks. We generated about um, 100 different instances of a, um, you know, fracture network with given, um, you know, uh, average properties. And we said, okay, the vertices are going to inherit the local and global topological and physical properties in this mapping. And we looked at uh, metrics uh, that are both to topological and um, you know, um, hydrological and uh, geometric. And we said, okay, what are, um, how, how well can we tell once we have done a you know, leave out cross validation train on 20 and then test on, uh, train on 80, sorry, and test on 20, how well can we uh, predict the characteristics of fractures that may be part of the backbone? And we, it turned out we were able to uh, reduce our network to about a third of the original. And then we compared the transport uh, breakthrough curves. I'll show that on the next slide. Um, one important feature that I want to point out here, and this goes back to the heart of our hypothesis. Um, why did we do all of this? Because we said the structure is important. And what, um, you know, what kind of bears that out? If we look at the top five features that kind of contributed to whether a fracture was on the backbone or not, um, you look at, you know, current flow, that's, you know, that's the physics, that's the flow, that's the flux, that makes sense. When there is more flow, some, uh, a fracture is uh, more, um, you know, likely to be part of the network. But simple paths, betweenness centrality, degree centrality, these are all metrics that describe how uh, the fracture is part of uh, the network between the inlet and the outlet. All of those, so the physics, which is the flow, and then the next three properties were uh, topological properties and permeability came in at fourth. And this was actually a big revelation to us because at the time when we started this work nearly you know, five years ago, we had no idea whether our hypothesis was even correct. We just had a um, kind of an inkling based on you know, site studies, et cetera, that uh, the topology really mattered. And even though this is a very simple um, abstraction of what we might see in the reservoir, it kind of bore out the fact that the connectivity played a crucial role. And going back to the fact that if we ignore the structure, the underlying structure, and just focus on abstracting out of permeability, then we are probably neglecting a lot of key things and our answers are going to be somewhat suspect. So let me show you how you know, I've, I've given you the top five features or whatever, but let me show you um, what that translates into for a breakthrough curve. So we want to here look at what the entire breakthrough curve looks like. And remember that in this case, um, when I say I'm going to validate my machine learning model, um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you if you say that to a physicist, an experimental physicist, they will get very um, angry if you talk about validation without an experiment. So I will make it very, very clear that what we are talking about here in terms of validation is with the high fidelity model. Because remember, our goal here is to find a good enough surrogate for the high fidelity model. We're not trying to match reality. Um, and 
I will, you know, give you some more information on, we've done a lot of that going from reality to our DFN works. So that, uh, so our software has been validated in the true sense with a lot of site studies. So that's not the validation we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do here is, okay, we know DFN works does a pretty good job of mimicking reality, but now can we find a surrogate for our DFN works model? So that's the second level of validation we're doing with our graph and machine learning based models. So let's take a minute to um, you know, talk about what the results here look like. Um, and I'll kind of go through these uh, fairly quickly from this point onwards, but I want to explain just this particular curve. Um, what we're aiming for is the blue curve, the one at the top uh, where you can see, um, you know, the breakthrough curve, it starts to increase and then you get diminishing returns. Uh, of course, this is, um, you know, on a log scale. Um, and uh, if you look at our ML pruning, uh, that was about a third of the original network. So this was when we were able to a priori determine what the prune network should be after we had trained it. Um, it's a pretty good representation of what um, the original DFN works is. And for reference, I'm showing you the shortest paths. Uh, so that's one where you know we can do it really, really quickly. And we brought it down to about, I want to say about... Um, 10% of the original network. And so um, correspondingly, you see the speed up. Your baseline is your DFN works. That's what we're trying to mimic. Um, we got a speed up of uh, you know, 10 times with the machine learning based pruning and about 100 times the shortest path. So you can look at the breakthrough curves and tell me the shortest path curve is absolutely useless. Right. If you want to look at the entire breakthrough curve, and I would say yes, I agree. Uh, what it is useful for is kind of this early part. Um, if you're looking at times between ten to the two and ten to the three, um, especially if you want to be, um, you know, have a conservative approach, then the shortest path. And so remember when I talked to you about that application for nuclear nonproliferation, um, typically there you're going to look at the first passage time. When does uh, a curve? Uh, the when when does the uh, the first few um, you know uh, gas molecules hit the atmosphere? So for those purposes, you can do a really really quick uh, representation with the shortest path. And if your decision is when do I have to go be ready with my sensors, then that's a perfectly acceptable way uh, to go use just the shortest path pruning and not worry about the rest of the physics. However, in the other application that I showed you where we're looking at the entire breakthrough curve, then we want to go to some something that's more like the machine learning pruning. Okay. So um, that's why I say sufficiently accurate uh, prune network with only a third of the original fractures. And again, because of N squared, you get, um, you know, 10 times computational savings. Um, let me uh, now- Gary, do you mind just answer one very yes. quick clarification question? Absolutely. Uh, so the question from the audience is for the classification, how to prune the graphic network, uh, what is the label data that you use? Sure. So the the labels are some of these uh, shown here, and these are these are just the top five. We used uh, probably about twenty to twenty five different labels. Uh, things like the geometry, like what is the aperture of the fracture, what is the degree of orientation of the fracture. Um, so those were all, um, and I so I'm forgetting um, everything else that we used, but it is in that paper. Uh, that's pointed to at the bottom, uh, Valera et al. Um, so there were about, um, you know, a couple dozen parameters that we used as uh, the features that we were selecting on for the classification. Does that answer the question? Um, I hope so. Uh, this was asked by audience members. So <laughs> if not, please follow up in Q&A. We can uh, sure. further discuss Yeah, I'm happy to go back to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so the next thing uh, we did was, uh, so one of the drawbacks of this machine learning based pruning was, um, I could kind of come up with a bunch of fractures. However, there was nothing inherent in that method to ensure connectivity. So I can just say, oh, these are the 20 fractures that should be part of your backbone. But if there's no way for me to get from my inlet to the outlet, if there's no connectivity, then 
um, your network is fairly useless. So we had to say, okay, well, that's not going to be good enough then. And we have to figure out a way where we can ensure connectivity. And that's where, you know, more the physics of the flow kind of comes into picture. So we said, okay, well, we want to, how about just looking at thresholding on the fluxes on the edges so we can ensure that we have a con in a connected path. And so we can still inherit the hydrologic properties and we still have the topological properties like you know the uh, intersections between the fractures. So we could start thresholding and say, okay, we are going to allow only this amount of um, anything above a certain level. And so when we, uh, and so this is you know fairly elementary type of pruning because all we're trying to look for is like the network flow and looking at what is the uh, flux on each of these edges. And this also came, uh, you know, to about a third of the original network. Uh, recall the other was 33%, this is 35%. And now I'm gonna put all of these together to show you what the breakthrough curves look like. And so, um, you know, again, DFN works is there for a baseline and um, the blue. And I just showed you the machine learning, that's the green. And so if we use the physics-based uh, pruning, uh, we get that red curve. So computationally, they're very similar uh, in terms of the network that they give you. However, the breakthrough curve here was not as good as what we got with the machine learning. So, um, you know, so they both have some drawbacks uh, with the machine learning. We had to be careful to ensure the connected network. Um, so what we had to do was essentially once we had a backbone, we had to go back in there and put in some edges um, if we had to ensure the connectivity for the flow to happen. Um, so in a sense, we're kind of just showing that, you know, what, what are the important things? The physics is important, the connectivity is important. Um, and so we, can we do a combination of these things? Perhaps yes, to get to a much faster, uh, if you look at the speed up, we, we're still getting about 10 times speed up with the calculations uh, by, you know, uh, going through some of these shortcuts. Okay, now I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about this, but I alluded to this when I talked about the lower uh, part of the workflow, where if you recall, um, I was talking about, you know, these are all items where you go back to the DFN. You say, okay, this is my pruned network. Now go back to the finite element model. And, um, it, but of course it's about a third of the original and run through it. So now I also talked about what can we do on the uh, bottom part of the graph? Can we actually run our um, you know, network transport algorithms? And sure, because pipe network uh, models have been around for a long time. So all we had to do was utilize a pipe network type of modeling to do that. And so um, because time is short and I wanna cover a couple other things, I'm not going into the details, but it's all, um, captured in this paper that I have uh, down here. And um, we were able to actually, like I previewed, um, get to the pruned graph and run network transport type of problems on the graph. And of course it came with a bit of correction that needed to be made. However, it was very easy for us to observe systematic you know, uh, biases that we were able to go back and uh, correct it. And these were the fastest running anything on the graph without utilizing finite element meshing was absolutely the fastest way to do it. And we got almost you know, four orders of magnitude speed up, especially um, if you take a little bit of hit and training uh, for your bias correction, uh, you do have to run a few high fidelity models. And then that tells you how you get to correct your bias. And in this case, I'm showing the purple one, it follows the, uh, the original blue that we were trying to mimic quite faithfully. And so um, in this particular case, you know, we, um, you know, for this part of what I've shown you, the conclusion is um, depending upon the quantity of interest, uh, the method that you pick uh, absolutely depends on that, right? So if I only wanted the shortest path calculation, that is super fast. I can just put together a few, uh, you know, like a few um, union of a few shortest paths and get the first passage time. That's plenty uh, sufficient. Um, and I don't even need to do any kind of machine learning a priori training 
none of that. I just need to put together shortest paths. So that's the easiest if all I'm looking for is first passage time. Um, if I wanted to do a full-blown transfer, uh, um, a, a transport on the graph, then uh, I could get it very quickly. So I can uh, essentially utilize this in a UQ framework. So I can run 10,000 simulations in the time that it took me to run just one simulation. Um, however, the drawback there um, is that I can't run anything complex. Like I can't run uh, anything more than just a simple transport. I can't have reactions. Um, I can't do anything that's, um, a, you know, having a finite element model would allow me to do. And so typically reality is somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's always a trade-off space between, you know, what are we looking for and where we're willing to compromise. Um, I do want to leave some time for questions. We only have like uh, 13 minutes left. So I'm going to very, very quickly in the next three minutes run through some of the other methods we tried. Um, you know, so like in the physics based pruning, uh, we introduced um, a mass flux threshold and tried to uh, see how we could adjust that threshold and how we could actually um, kind of uh, tune the size of our uh, backbone, how many fractures we could get. And here are some results for, you know, if we could get it down to um, like a third of the original or 80% of the original, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this actually allows you to kind of introduce as a tuning parameter. So instead of all or nothing, we kind of get to be able to tune it and ensure fracture connectivity here. Um, and so typically, you know, uh, the machine learning methods have been a little agnostic to the connectivity. Like I said, and the, you know, we had to go back and ensure that we put in some um, edges and vertices that would ensure that we had a path from inlet to outlet. And so um, another idea that we had thought about was, okay, instead of classifying just fractures, how about we have a combination? We classify paths instead. Um, so that builds in your connectivity. And so this is a truly physics informed method. It says, I need to be able to go from point A to point B. I can't do it without connectivity. But now instead of classifying individual fractures, we um, ended up classifying the paths itself. So, um, so union of paths, again, we used uh, random forest, logistic regression, SVM methods, and um, you know, with um, about a fifth of the backbone, we're able to get pretty good uh, you know, recall of 90%. Um, and you know, all of this is again, like I said, I show I'm showing you individual instances. But essentially, what you need to be able to do is run all of this in a, uh, you know, in a UQ framework, because none of us know that this is indeed how the fractures look underground. So we end up doing statistical distributions. So um, we, again, I'll refer you to this paper for, actually, it's not in preparation, sorry. The, it, it is out there. Um, I think it's a um, Siam Journal of uh, UQ, if I'm not mistaken. Um, apologize for the outdated information there. Uh, but Dave Ostis is the first author, but we looked at a forward modeling and a backward. So we go forward and we propagate the fluxes, we go backward and we prune, and then we get a generative model to sample the backbones. And in this, and so this is the growth model going forward and the trimming model going backwards. And um, here's some pictures. Sorry, this might take a while, but I'll talk you through it. Um, so this is how the entire model is constructed going forward. And then the trimming model goes in reverse and removes some of the paths and the edges that are not needed in order for this backbone to be completed. And um, essentially, again, with the tuning parameter, we're able to control the size of the uh, model. And we have some results here on, uh, you know, with, uh, different parameters, how we're able to kind of um, match the breakthrough curves. And the red here is the frame of reference and how well we do it for the different parameter sizes. So anyways, I'm gonna wrap this up. These are, you know, uh, probably talked about like five or six different methods that we tried out in order to understand uh, what parameters were important and uh, kind of um, modeling for the quantities of interest that we need. And one of the bigger uh, findings was, you know, the breakthrough curves are averaged in general, 
And so those calculations of you know, quantities of interest where we're looking at the breakthrough curve, it is quite forgiving in the sense that even with a fifth of the model or a third of the model, um, we're able to replicate breakthrough curves fairly easily. So trying to find out what is the percolating path, what is the backbone is fairly um, easy if you're looking at the breakthrough curve. Now, if you're looking at exactly where in time and space there are certain quantities, these may not be the best methods. So, um, and also we're not looking at any variations in within the fractures. So these methods that we've talked about are you know, relevant for many of our practical applications, but the caveat is there will be a few that they're not relevant for. And um, as I mentioned, in all of these, the fractures are static. Even when in the explosion case, you know, typically the fractures, um, <clears throat> the flow time is much slower compared to the time of formation of fractures. So what we looked at so far was static fractures, but we're starting to look at dynamically changing fractures. So <clears throat> if the path itself starts to open up or close up, that's our next um, avenue of research. So. Um, that's all I had, uh, some listing of papers, but <clears throat> I'm happy to send that to anybody that's interested. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. This was uh, how to take a shortcut through a fractured network. <laughs> 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 we, and not lose your way. <laughs> so are there any questions from the audience? If you do have a question, just raise your hand and I will uh, allow you to talk um, and you can ask question verbally, or you can type it into at this point Q&A or chat, anything works. So, um, so anybody? Okay, so Bi Cheng, uh, go ahead and I, I allowed you to talk. So if you unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Masa and uh, Gori. So this is Bi Cheng from Kaos. I used to work in Nano as well. So uh, this is very interesting work. I really enjoy it. So uh, did you do any uh, UQ work based on this uh, calibrated or pruned network? Yes, and that's um, actually, let me see if I can, that's in this uh, paper number six, O'Malley. So uh, we looked at uh, multi-fidelity Monte Carlo methods. So uh, basically what we were looking at is to how do we improve both precision and accuracy? Um, so we, we you know, uh, train the bias essentially, we train to learn the bias. So we run about, you know, given, you know, depends on what your computational budget is, but if you have about a hundred instances that you wanna run, you can run about 10 of those in the high fidelity uh, model and then figure out what the corresponding 10 low fidelity model the results are and learn what that gap looks like. So you can bridge that for the other 90% uh, percent of the models that you're not willing to run the high fidelity for. So that work was done. Um, that's part of one of the UQ approaches we took. And again, this um, the directed acyclic graphs method that I just very briefly um, showed you here, that's in that paper with, um, you know, Ostis, um, as the first author. So this was another way where we could actually uh, look at an ensemble of reactions, uh, sorry, an ensemble of uh, simulations and figure out how we can go towards the, um, uh, you know, the right size of the backbone, depending upon the UQ that uh, the, you know, uncertainty levels that we were willing to tolerate. So I will point you to two of those papers and I'm happy to uh, send you those references. Uh, that would be great. Thank you very much. So you basically use the high fidelity as the initial and then ultimately just use the low fidelity. Right. In most case, in, in the multi, in the MCMC case, certainly, mm -hmm. yes. Um, uh, for the fracture, for this, uh, let's say, uh, graphic network, how do you ultimately parameterize it? Sorry, how do I what? Par parameterize it. Oh, how do you parameterize it? Uh, so we have a lot. So... We have a lot of really excellent site characterization data. So like I said, you know, you know where some of the larger features are and you know statistically like what are the, uh, you know, log means, et cetera, for some of these, you know, values which are either hydrologic or even uh, fracture aperture, you know, uh, what that distribution looks like. So we know what the distributions of a lot of the aggregate values are. 
And so we draw from those distributions typically in order to parameterize our models. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, if possible, could you send us a, uh, send me the reference? I can share my email in the chat box. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for answering. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Roberto Rizzo, uh, I have uh, unmuted you if you'd like to ask a question or I can just ask it for you. Um, and then you can follow up if I messed something up in the question. <laughs> so he thanks you for a fantastic talk. And he's asking if it's possible to go from field fracture data to graph representation of the fractures without going through DFN works. Uh <clears throat> yes, uh, it is possible. Uh, you can uh, directly inherit the properties without going through the FN works. Uh, however, the only thing I will caution is, as I've shown you, in each one of these methods, there's always something you're giving up. And um, the reason we go through the FN works is to kind of do a sanity check because we don't want to tout a model um, that we're not quite sure of what the actual result ought to be. So it's more of a sanity check. However, if you have a really well-characterized site and let's say you've done a bunch of training already, but some things have changed, uh, it's absolutely possible to go directly to the factor, uh, the, sorry, the graph uh, representation without going through the DFN works model. Um, but like I said, with anything machine learning or anything reduced order model, uh, you know, essentially this is just a reduced order model, right? Like we're just trying to um, literally like reduce the size of the model, uh, not just in dimensionality, like we, we're used to thinking about like which are the dimensions that matter the most, but we're reducing the actual size of the network itself, like physically. Uh, so I would just, you know, offer a word of caution. Um, anytime we, you know, uh, taking advantage of something here, you know, we're gonna give something up and it's uh, the responsible thing to know what we're giving up. So that's the only thing I'll say. Roberto, does that answer your question? Hope so. If not, you can un unmute yourself. Yes, that was great, thanks. Very clear, thank you very much. Thank you, thanks, thanks for the questions, yeah. Anybody else has a question? I have one. If nobody else is asking, so let me <laughs> throw in one question. So um, has anybody looked at graph of um, basically the fracture network connectivity versus all kinds of other graphs? And how do they, what is the essential difference? Because Brain is a graph, you know, neurons form a graph, social media is a graph, uh, yeah. airports are a graph. Yes, exactly. <laughs> How do they, if, yeah. what is the essential for it? That's, that's a great question. And, you know, I actually want to say, I'll pull on one of the threads that you just said, you know, social network. Um, the thing that's special about some of the problems that we look at as scientists is that there is an underlying physics, right? to the representation, like, um, you know, shopping data or, you know, Facebook data, all of that. There isn't, you know, that's entire purely- There's no driven. partial differential equation. Exactly. This <laughs> Modeling. Is a, exactly. Shopping this is a physics-informed data science study. And so there is a significant difference. And it could also, you know, in some cases we know the physics, right? Like we know there's the advection dispersion equation underlying all of that, that we can't violate. So there, that's, that's one of the big differences, but there's a lot of work out there on graphs. And in fact, some of the work we've done, we are also uh, using some of the methods um, in um, you know, uh, studies of like how uh, you know, uh, cells grow and you know, cancer cells, what are, the you know, what are the types of cells that they attach to and things like that. So uh, there's a wide um, you know, variety of applications if you look for graph-based applications out there. <laughs> 